If you have your Bibles with you, please open with me to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. We've come to the end of a very long journey through the book of Exodus. I trust that if you've been here with us through the whole thing, that it has been helpful and beneficial to your faith and your own Christian journey. Uh, and today we're going to bring this series to a close. And uh, to set the stage for the sermon this morning, I want to start with asking you a question. What is the pinnacle of the Christian journey? You don't have to throw out an answer, just think about it. What is the pinnacle of the Christian journey? What is the climax, the high point, the summit of the Christian journey? Throughout this 37-week Exodus series, we have maintained that Exodus, the Exodus story that we see here in Scripture, is a physical, historical journey that the people of Israel took that mirrors the spiritual journey that we as Christians take. This has been the premise that we followed and that we've repeated over and over and over again. What we are seeing in the Exodus story is physical pictures of our spiritual realities. Now, if this premise holds true through the end of the book, which is what we're approaching today, that Exodus pictures the Christian journey from beginning to end, then what we should expect to find in the end of Exodus is the answer to that question. What is the pinnacle of the Christian journey? Now, as we come to Exodus chapters 35 through 40, which is the climax and conclusion of the story of Exodus, I believe that we're going to see that it perfectly mirrors the climax and the pinnacle of our Christian journey. Now, we're not going to be covering all of these chapters. What we've seen in this last section of Exodus is that we've handled a lot of chapters at once but we've preached them thematically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present to you a theme that these last five chapters of Exodus present to us and show us how it culminates in the pinnacle, not only of the Exodus story, but of our story as Christians as well. So let's just take a moment to quiet our hearts. I'm going to allow you a second to pray and ask the Spirit to come and work in you through the message, and then we will continue on. Father, the sound of silence as your people seek you is a beautiful thing. And we pray that as we approach your word today, that you would come and that you would be among us by the power of your spirit, taking what we see in your word and implanting it deep in our hearts, that we might believe and trust what we see in your word and live according to it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Kids, I have uh, an assignment for you. If you have a piece of paper or a pen, pencil, something like that, something to write with, I have a word tracker for you. And what that means is that I'm going to give you a word, and every time I say that word, I want you to put a little tick on your paper. And then when, you, uh, when the sermon's over, you can come up and show me how many times I said that word. So the word I want you guys to be listening for and focusing on is the word dwell or dwelling. If you don't know what that word means, you can ask your parents real quick. So every time I say that word, I want you guys to put a little tick and then you can come show me at the end of the sermon. Now, before we jump into Exodus 35 through 40 and primarily focusing on uh, chapter 40, what I want to do is I want to first trace how Israel got to this place in the Exodus story and point out along the way how this has paralleled with our Christian journey. So the Exodus story began, as we'll remember, with Israel enslaved in Egypt. 
They had been under the brutal oppression of Pharaoh for, under four, for over 400 years, and they were in desperate need of deliverance. And as we saw, this part of the Exodus story parallels where we stood before we came to faith in Christ. When we were unbelievers, we were enslaved not to Pharaoh, but to our sins, and we were under the power of Satan. We were ruled and oppressed by our sinful desires, and they created chaos and destruction in our lives. And like Israel, we were in desperate need of deliverance from ourselves and from the power of Satan in our lives. Now, as Israel was living under the weight of this oppression, they cried out to God, and God heard their cry and decided to intervene to save his people. God sovereignly preserves and raises up a deliverer from among his people to be his agent of deliverance, and we know that this was Moses, right? Yahweh sends Moses to Pharaoh with signs and wonders and demands that Pharaoh let his people go. And Pharaoh refuses over and over and over again until God sends the tenth and final plague, which was the killing of the firstborn, which God graciously spared his people from through the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. In his sorrow, Pharaoh demands that Israel leave Egypt And they do so in the night, rejoicing in their newfound freedom. Now this part of the Exodus story parallels our salvation in Christ and our conversion, our being brought out of our sin. We see in this deliverance a picture of our salvation in Christ. Out of a desire to make His glory known and out of a love for humanity, God sovereignly preserves and raises up a deliverer to save sinners from their sins. Jesus comes to this world with signs and wonders and He takes upon Himself the judgment of God for His people. And the oppression of sin and the power of Satan are broken not through the blood of a sacrificial lamb but through the blood of of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Thus, Jesus secures the freedom of all those who trust in Him through His death, resurrection, and ascension. Now, from Egypt, God leads Israel in the wilderness to the Red Sea, where He demonstrates His glory by once and for all destroying Pharaoh and his army. God then teaches Israel important lessons about his leading and their spiritual need for him through the use of manna and water in the wilderness as they travel to Mount Sinai. At Sinai, Yahweh graciously enters into covenant relationship with Israel by giving them the law, the Ten Commandments, where he promises to be their God and where he requires of them holiness in the way they interact with one another, and in the way in which they worship Him. Now, this stage of the Exodus story parallels our Christian life. The destruction of Pharaoh and his army foreshadows the final judgment when God will cast Satan and his demons not into a sea of water, but into a lake of fire. We are also taught through the manna and water in the wilderness of our spiritual need for Christ as the bread that has come down from heaven and as the true water from the rock to sustain us in our spiritual journey. Likewise, Jesus shows us that to love and abide in relationship with him, we must obey his commandments. Now, Israel's journey with God is marred time and time again by idolatry and by breaking God's commands, and their holiness is tarnished, and they need to be interceded for and cleansed through ritual and sacrifice. And like Israel, we as Christians struggle with spiritual idolatry and sinning against God and others. We need to be repeatedly cleansed of our sin through repentance and through the intercession, not of Moses, but of Jesus, so that we can be faithful representatives of God in the world. Now, after Moses, which we saw last week, intercedes for Israel and their holiness is restored, 
We now come to chapters 35 through 40, where we see the climax and conclusion of the Exodus story. Now, when you look at chapters 35 through 40 of the book of Exodus, what you're going to see is Moses carrying out all of the commands that God gave him in relation to the construction of the tabernacle, the making of the priest's garments, and of the consecration of the priests for service. So a couple weeks ago, we we covered a lot of that detail in chapters 25 through 31. What you see in chapters 35 through 40 is all of those same commands repeated with the additional refrain of, and Moses did this. And Moses commanded the Israelites to construct the tabernacle and all of its furniture in the exact way that God commanded them to. It's basically a a direct repetition of what we see just a few chapters earlier. Now, in the midst of the repeated details, I don't want us to miss what I think is crucial for this point in the Exodus story in its conclusion, and that is the reason for the construction of the tabernacle. We saw a couple weeks ago that part of the reason for the tabernacle was to be a place where God was worshipped by His people. But there's a more fundamental reality about the tabernacle that we need to understand. And we see this clearly stated in chapter 25, verse 8, where God says this to Moses. He says, And let them, that is Israel, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Yes, the tabernacle was to be a place where God was worshipped, but most fundamentally and most importantly, it was a place where the presence of God dwelled. It was a, a place where the presence of God lived. It was, in a very real sense, the presence of God among His people in His holy home. This is the ultimate purpose for the tabernacle. God wanted to live among His people. And he does so in the tabernacle. So seeing this purpose for the tabernacle helps us understand God's ultimate aim and goal in redeeming his people from Egypt. The whole story has been moving toward this climax. God delivers his people from oppression under Pharaoh and their slavery in Egypt for this purpose. In order to dwell with them and be their God. And this is what we're about to see. Now, this moment not only serves as the climax to the Exodus story, but it also marks an immense step forward toward regaining what we lost in the Garden of Eden. You'll remember that in Genesis it says that Adam and Eve walked with the Lord. Adam and Eve experienced the presence of God in a sin-free world. But once they sinned, they were banished from the garden and barred from the presence of God. Now, hundreds of years later, we see God taking a massive step towards dwelling with humanity again. That's what we see here in the conclusion to Exodus. Exodus 40 verses 33 and 34 describe this incredible moment. And he, that is Moses, erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. At the finishing of the tabernacle, the cloud that previously covered the top of Mount Sinai now moved to cover the tabernacle. And what this represented was that the glory of the Lord and His presence was now inside the tabernacle. He is now dwelling among His people. About the magnitude of this moment, one commentator says, This heralded the coming of the Lord into His home. Durham notes the sense of impatience and urgency with which verse 33 is followed by verse 34. Moses finished the work and the cloud covered the tent. 
It is as though the Lord can't wait to come and live with his people. So this is what we are seeing here in this this amazing text as it transitions to the glory of the Lord coming down. The text seems to be indicating a sense of fulfilled anticipation that marks the high point of the Exodus story. God is condescending and is now dwelling among his people. And you have to wonder if you're reading the whole story of the Bible, if this is the end of the story, if this is the moment where God is going to restore us to what we lost in Eden. Is this it? Will humanity finally have regained what they lost in the Garden of Eden? Well, just as soon as we reach this amazing climax in the story, the following verse strikes a low note. Verse 35. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we see this amazing high note in the story. The presence of God condescends and begins to live in the tabernacle among his people and then we're immediately met with this low note. Moses was not able to enter. So although the presence of God had descended within the tabernacle, this does not mean that the people have free access to him. And we saw this a few weeks ago when we talked in detail about the tabernacle. We saw that it was divided into two rooms that were both separated by a fine twined linen veil. The first room was the holy place where only the priests could go. And the second room was the most holy place, which was only accessible to the high priest once a year. And in this most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God with his people. So in a very real sense, when we see the glory of the Lord condescend and dwell in the tabernacle, he is dwelling in this very small room which was only accessible to one person once a year. So what we see here is that there is still distance between God's presence and his people. And the distance is made clear through the veils that are guarding access to each room in the tabernacle. So yes, God has condescended to dwell among his people, but... They don't have free access to him. And this ending of the book of Exodus on both a high note and a low note shows us two important things. The first is this, that the high note, that is God's presence entering the tabernacle and dwelling among his people, this high note teaches us the ultimate goal of God's plan of redemption. And that is, his ultimate goal is to create a holy people that can dwell with him and that he can dwell with. Exodus began with a people in bondage and it ends with a free people dwelling with their God. God redeems a people so that he can dwell with them and be their God and so that they can worship him. This is the ultimate purpose of God's people. And this is what the high note of Exodus teaches us. But secondly, the low note in Exodus shows us that the story isn't over yet. In other words, God has something better planned for his relationship with his people than the restricted access to his presence that Israel enjoyed. There's something better coming, is what this low note tells us. And it's not until the coming of Jesus that we begin to see clearly what this better plan is for God's relationship with his people. Turn with me to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 14. 
Listen to what John says about the coming of Jesus. John 1.14 And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, there is absolutely no doubt that what John is doing in this verse is connecting Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, to the tabernacle, showing that Jesus is the new dwelling place of God on earth. And we know this for two reasons. We see this first in the Greek word that is translated as dwelt in this verse. In the Greek, this verse or this uh, word is literally translated as tabernacle. So if you were to read this verse literally, it would go like this. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's the word that we translate into English as dwelt. So John is connecting Jesus to the tabernacle, showing that he is the new dwelling place of God. We see that in this Greek translation, in this Greek word, but we see it secondly in the fact that the Father's glory fills Jesus. Just like the glory of the Lord condescended and began to dwell in the tabernacle, so too Jesus is filled with the glory of the Lord. And in Colossians 1.19, Paul also confirms this when he says, For in Him, that is in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. John is showing us here, the New Testament is showing us here, that God is now taking another step toward dwelling with humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, in the incarnate Son of God. Jesus is now replacing what the tabernacle was in being a dwelling place for the glory of the Lord. But the New Testament doesn't stop here. It goes further than saying that Jesus is the new tabernacle and the new presence, uh, dwelling place of the presence of God on earth. It also goes on to show us how the death of Christ affects our access to the presence of God as believers And in order to see this, we need to contrast the work that Moses completed in Exodus and the result of that work and the work that Jesus completed and the result of that work. So we saw in Exodus 40 verses 33 and 34 that the result of Moses finishing the work, which is what it says, and Moses finished the work, the result of that was what? The tabernacle being finished and the glory of the Lord condescending and dwelling among His people with restricted access to Him. Now, what is the result of Jesus finishing His work? Well, when we put together the narrative of Christ's death from the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Matthew, we see what Jesus' death accomplished for his people. John 19 30, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, this is what it says. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What is Jesus talking about? What was finished? The work that God gave Jesus to do was finished, was now complete. Now what was the result of Jesus completing this work? Matthew 27, 51, which chronologically would follow right after John 19, 30 in the sequence of events on the cross, says this, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. From top to bottom. So if we were to read these verses together in chronological order, this is what it would say. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
This was the result of Jesus completing the work that the Father had given him to do. The curtain that created the barrier between Israel and God's presence in the tabernacle was torn. It was torn in two. Moses' finishing of the work resulted in God's presence dwelling in the tabernacle, but Israel had little access to that presence. The result of Jesus' it is finished was the removal of the barrier that kept God's people from his presence. That's what we see here. And what this means for us is that the effect that Jesus' death had on his people is that it removes their sin and makes them holy. It makes them into a dwelling place fit for the presence of God. And this is where we see the next stage in God's presence dwelling with his people take place. When Jesus dies, rises from the dead, and then ascends to the Father, we don't lose the presence of God with us on earth. Because what Jesus does is he sends down the Holy Spirit. And having made us holy as his people through his death, he makes us a worthy dwelling place for the presence of God. And so the Spirit of God comes and now begins to indwell us, His people, and we become the new tabernacle of God. We become the presence, or we become the temple where God's presence dwells. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says it this way, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So through Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, he has made us into temples where the presence of God dwells through the Holy Spirit. Because of what Christ has done, we have greater access to the presence of God than the people of old did, than Israel did. And so what we see here in the progression of God's presence with his people throughout the scriptures is that we were living in an unsin-stained world in the Garden of Eden, walking with God, experiencing His presence perfectly. And then Adam and Eve sinned, and they are barred from the presence of God. They are put outside the Garden. And then in Exodus, God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to live among my people again. But it's going to be with restricted access. Build me a holy home. Build me a tabernacle. He condescends to live among his people. And then when we turn the pages to the New Testament, God says, I'm doing something better. I'm going to send the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, to take on human flesh and dwell among humanity as a human. And then when he dies and rises from the dead and ascends to the Father, he makes us a holy dwelling place and he sends the Holy Spirit of God to indwell us as his new tabernacles. As his new representation of his presence in the world. This is the, the progress of the presence of God with his people in the scriptures. Now, brothers and sisters, this marks a high note for us as Christians. A high note that the people of Israel did not get to experience like we do. We experience blessings and the presence of God in a way that they did not. But like Israel, we also have a low note. What we experience of the presence of God right now is not the pinnacle of our relationship with God. Is not the pinnacle or the climax of our experience of the presence of God in our lives. Although we have more access to the presence of God through the Holy Spirit than Israel did, we still do not experience relationship with God as we were meant to. Our low note that keeps us from the fullness of God is our sinful nature and our ongoing struggle with sin. The Holy Spirit is housed in this sinful flesh, as Paul would say. 
And this keeps us from experiencing the presence of God and relationship with God as he desires. But just as the low note in the Exodus story of limited access to God pointed forward to Christ and the indwelling of the Spirit that we now enjoy, so too our low note of ongoing sin points us to the pinnacle and the climax of our Christian journey. And we see this most clearly in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with him and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Brothers and sisters, the pinnacle of our Christian journey is life eternal with God in a sinless world. We don't yet experience that, but we will. The Exodus story and the story of Scripture shows us that we were made for perfect fellowship with God. This is what we were created for, and this is the destiny that we are moving toward. We lost that in the Garden of Eden due to our sin, but God through Christ will perfectly restore us one day to unstained life with Him. So let's take a few moments to apply a little bit of what we've seen here this morning. Brothers and sisters, if the climax and conclusion of the Exodus story is about living life with God, God condescends to dwell among his people. And if the climax and conclusion of the Christian journey is about the same, what we just saw in Revelation 21, if this is what we were made for and if this is the destiny that we are moving toward, shouldn't we make it the priority and purpose of our lives to cultivate and deepen our life with God now? Shouldn't we be making it our priority to know our God more? A priority that goes beyond three hours on a Sunday morning. Shouldn't we be making it our aim to walk in obedience to him? Shouldn't we be taking our sin seriously and seeking to walk in greater fellowship with God through repentance and obedience to him? Shouldn't we be making it our priority to conform our marriages to the patterns given by God? Shouldn't we be having the hard conversations with our spouses that lead to living life not just as a couple, but as a couple with God? Parents, shouldn't we be making it our mission to pass on life with God to our children? Shouldn't we be living our lives with God in such a way that when our children see that, it makes them desire and want that life for themselves. Shouldn't we be making it our priority to call unbelievers to join us in living life with God? Shouldn't we be weeping over the sin-sick world we live in and seeking to bring the joys of life with God into it? Shouldn't we stop complaining about how bad the world is and realize that we have something greater to offer it? And just go out into the world 
loving God and loving others. Transforming the world around us through showing the world what life with God is really like. Shouldn't we be analyzing every area of our lives and striving to bring it into alignment with the purpose we were created for and with the pinnacle that we are moving toward? Now, brothers and sisters, when I take time to analyze my own life life in, in these ways and in many others, I am often amazed at how nearsighted I can become, how easily I lose sight of the pinnacle that I'm moving toward and the purpose I was created for and how little that informs the way in which I live my life now. I resonate closely with this statement from John MacArthur. He says, believers who do not have heaven on their minds trivialize their lives. They hinder the power of the church and they become absorbed with the fading things of this world. I identify with that in my own life. And I assume that I am not alone in that struggle. But brothers and sisters, God has crafted a master plan to redeem us and bring us back into fellowship with him. And he has given us a foretaste of what that is going to be like through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit now. Let us not ignore where our story is leading, the pinnacle that awaits us. Richard Phillips says it well. He says, in the age to come, the longing of every spirit to know God and see his face will be perfectly fulfilled. The communion that God has eternally purposed to enjoy with his people will be achieved. And this is what we must continually hold before our minds. This pinnacle that we are moving toward of life with God. Brothers and sisters, let us fix this vision of life with God before our minds and let us pray that the Spirit would cultivate in our hearts a deeper longing to walk in that life now. That we might be a holy people showing the world what life with God truly looks like. Let's pray. Father, you have been so merciful and gracious to reveal your glory, the glory of who you are, the glory of your redemption of your people, of your leading them, of your loving them, of your dwelling with them. You have been so gracious to reveal all of these beautiful and glorious truths to us throughout this Exodus story. And Lord, I pray that everything that we have learned in this book and here today with the climax of life with God would not fall on deaf ears, but that these words would fall on hearts that are soft and malleable, moldable, that your spirit would make us joyful recipients of your word and of this truth that we were created for life with you and that you would teach each one of us here by the power of your spirit within us what that means for each and every one of our lives and how we can conform our lives in a greater way to living life with you. May we do this by the power of your spirit for the glory of Christ's name so that we can represent you faithfully in this world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys for being with us. Thank you for hanging in there in this Exodus series. Uh, It was long, but I think really rich and fruitful
I know it was fun for me to have a part in preaching it, uh, and I know the other pastors feel the same. Thanks for taking this journey with us. Kids, uh, if you want to show me how many times I said the word dwell or or dwelling, uh, I would love to see, so come up and show me. Go in peace. Have a good week.